Is everybody ready to start the PowerPoint presentation? Uh, yeah, I am. Okay, yeah. okay. And um, when we get back from the PowerPoint, then we will do the, uh, the critique of what people have turned in. And I'm hoping if somebody comes while I'm giving the, the PowerPoint presentation, they end up sitting in the waiting room because I'm sharing the screen and I can't see the waiting room while I'm sharing the screen. So there's maybe somebody who's like stuck in the waiting room and I hope not. But I suppose that would be better than having them not really even be here. Oh, here we've got somebody kicked out to the waiting room. Okay, so. Let's go ahead and start the review. I hope I don't have the timing set for this. Sometimes I have the timing set. So here's the final review. Remember, I want you to remember the keyboard shortcut. So you will have to for one or another of the questions, maybe more than one, maybe two, you'll have to be able to say what this keyboard shortcut means, or say these keyboard shortcuts mean these things and, and I'm going to do some matching or whatever. But so make sure that you remember the keyboard shortcuts. And the ones that are the most important is U is very important because when you press U, whatever layer you have selected, or if all, if none of them are selected, all of the layers will work. It's a toggle switch and it will show you what type of motion, what type of, of keyframes you have set for your layers. And if they are already being shown, it will make them disappear. So it will collapse the layers so you can see more of your timeline. So the U is a very important shortcut. And I find that I use the U constantly. AA, when you have 3D layers and you have a 3D layer selected, if you press AA, it will show you the materials options and the geometry options for that 3D layer. Or if it's a light that you have selected or a camera, it will show you the light options or the camera options for those types of layers. So you'll be able to check things. If you find that your shadows aren't working, you will be able to find which of the layers has shadows, cast shadows turned on and which has it turned off. You'll be able to see if your lights are set to cast shadows and you'll be able to see, is my camera actually in the right place? You know, is it, is it somehow not set correctly? So pressing AA, that helps when you're working with 3D for all kinds of different things. It shows you what your material is doing and what kind of geometry you've got. When you're working with sound, it's very important to know what the waveform is doing. So if you have a sound layer selected and you press LL, it will reveal the waveform for a selected audio layer. So remember, that's what I was showing you so much when we were doing the keyframe interpolation because you can see where the peaks and valleys in your sound file are. And then you'll be able to locate where you want to put a keyframe. So waveforms, very important whenever you are syncing audio with image. And then here you can see that if you want to get any of the transforms, you press P for position, S for scale, and R for rotation, and T for opacity. And the text for that didn't show up, but it's back in that previous slide. So we can go back to that slide. Here we go. So you can see T is opacity, R is rotation, S is scale, and P is position. They're right down at the bottom of the top part. Keyboard shortcuts in the timeline when you're working with After Effects. So I'll have to fix that next time I show it. <laughs> After Effects 3D lights. There are four types of lights available in After Effects. And it's important to know which kind of light you are using 
because each of them has different characteristics. An ambient light doesn't cast shadows. It's a fill light with no definite direction, but it does help when you're trying to see more objects lit up. It does help when you want to have something filling in. I think somebody just got into the waiting room. Well, we went back keyboard shortcuts again. We don't want to do that. Um, I'm going to stop sharing here for a second and check. Yep, there's someone in the waiting room. Okay, so now we're going back to sharing. <laughs> this is what I mean. It's really frustrating um, because I have to uh, check to see if someone's coming in. Okay, then a spotlight. A spotlight will cast shadows, but it has a definite, definite de direction and a focus. And you know that when you work with it, the cone will determine where the edge of the light is. So it's important to know what type of light you're using. If you want to see everything, an ambient light will let you see everything, but it won't cast shadows. If you want to cast shadows, a spotlight will cast shadows, but it only fills in inside of the cone. So there's a difference between those two. That's very important to remember. A point light will cast shadows. It fills out from the center, so it has a source. And then the light just goes out in all directions. It's like if you have a bare light bulb without, without a uh, lampshade on it, the light comes out in every direction. And it comes out, sort of radiates out from one central point. A point light casts shadows. It fills from the center. And it, well, that's what I was talking about. Okay, that's the point light. It, ha it fills from the center, it has a source, it's like a light bulb. And then the parallel light casts shadows. It lights evenly, it has a definite direction, but no focus. And the light is going in parallel rays. So the shadow will not spread out. It will completely go straight. So it's like, it's like an infinitely distant light, like a, the sun. So that's a parallel light. The ambient light, this is what it would look like if you have a blue solid with an ambient light. It's uniformly blue. There's no change anywhere across it because the ambient light will evenly light any surface. It fills the area with consistent level of illumination. That's what it means. And then the spotlight has a specific source and a direction. It has a cone shape and it can have a soft or sharp edge. And if an object goes behind the light, so if it comes closer to the viewer, than the back of the light, it just will not be lit. It'll be dark. A point light is like incandescent light bulb. It has a position and the light is emitted outward in a complete circle. It casts shadows. So it's like, it's like you have a lamp with no shade and you're holding it out. A parallel light casts shadows in straight parallel lines. They're all equidistant. It's just like the sun, it's so far away that all the rays will travel in a straight line. They don't spread apart. So if you have it directly in front and shooting straight at the image, the shadow will be cast immediately behind it. And if you don't move the light to a, a a little bit off center and maybe down or something, you won't see the shadow at all because it will be behind the image. So 3D layers will allow cast shadows and they're calculated from the direction of source of light. It passes through the position and shape of the 3D objects in the path of the light rays. It will not cast shadows from 2D objects. Shadows can only be cast 
If the 3D layers have the correct material settings, the light is a spotlight pointer parallel type with cast shadows enabled. And if you want to make sure that your shadows are going to work, and if, if there's something that you can't see a shadow and you want to find out why not, in the foreground layers, you want to make sure to turn on 3D, enable shadows under the materials options, and in the background layer, you want to turn on 3D and enable accepts shadows under the materials options. So first thing, it has to be a, a 3D layer. It can't be a 2D layer. So 2D layers will not cast shadows. 2D layers will not accept shadows. So you have to make them 3D. You can have an effect that calculates a shadow, but it's not the same as a cast shadow and it doesn't have anything to do with your lights. Three D space, x, y, and z coordinates. The Cartesian coordinate system—that's what it call, is called. It refers to the x, y, and z graph used to place objects in the three D computer graphics world. So Descartes was a mathematician who decided that the different axes should be called x, y, and z. So they call it a Cartesian coordinate system. Z space is in the 3D world of After Effects, the Z axis is oriented away from the viewer and therefore a negative Z number will bring an object closer to the viewer and a positive Z number will be further away from the viewer. So Z is in and out. The X axis is the red arrow axis. It's the horizontal axis. Numbers on the rulers will start at the left at zero and move to 1280 at the right because we're doing 1280 by 720. The Y axis is the green arrow axis. It's the vertical axis. Numbers will start at the top at zero and move to 720 at the bottom of the screen. And then the Z axis is the blue arrow axis. It's the depth in space axis. Numbers will start at zero in the mid plane of the screen. They grow positively as you move away from the viewer and negatively as you move towards the viewer. So this shows you where the x-axis is here. So the first number, the red arrow axis, use this coordinate to move objects to either side of the stage, so left or right. The y-axis is the middle number, it's the green arrow axis. Use this coordinate to move things up or down on the stage. And then the Z axis is the blue arrow axis. Use this arrow to move objects in front of or behind other objects, or to position the lights or the cameras to best show your composition. So in 3D space, you've got X, Y, and Z rotations. A rotation of 90 degrees around the X axis will allow you to lay a flat plane down like a floor or a ceiling, and using the position on the Y, you can move it up or down. A rotation of 90 degrees on the Y axis will allow you to create a wall in the middle of the stage, and using X, you can move it left, oh heck. It's not going back, is it? Come on, go back there. So this is like driving me crazy. It's got, I'm gonna stop the sharing because what it's doing, and I can tell this, what it's doing is, let's see, it's, It's got timing. It should not have timing. Okay, I'm gonna try it again here. Okay, so, slideshow play from current. So, you can move things up and down on the stage with the green arrow axis. The red arrow axis, you can move objects 
to either side of the stage, or the x axis, yeah, the red arrow axis, either side of the stage. It's just, this is just driving me crazy. Okay, so the z axis, use this arrow to move the objects in front of or behind other objects, or to position the lights or cameras to best show your composition. The important thing to remember with the z axis, remember if you have a number that is exactly the same as another layer in the z, it might interfere with being able to see it visually. And any time you have one or another of your layers disappear at some point in your animation, it means that you may have gone across the same number for the Z most likely, but sometimes even the X or Y. So you can't have them in the same plane in the same place because it has to decide which object it wants to actually render and it will drop one out. So anytime you lose something, just add one or two pixels to each of the position settings and see what happens. And it, that will fix it probably. So rotating the X, Y, and Z. So the Z axis, you can make it spin around like a, a plane. It's doing this again. <laughs> It's going backwards and forwards, stop it. So anyway, so then you can make your, your Z axis makes it spin around like it's, it's the, uh, it's like a pinwheel. Now I have the animation of this available on Canvas. So all you need to do is go to that rotations link and it will show you this in an animation that I made. And here's why. So this is important to know because when you want to rotate something and you can't remember which way it's going to rotate, you can look at some of these notes that I've made and you can decide what you need to do. I always have to check. And then Z. Z is the one that turns like a pinwheel. The text animators. These are the facts about text animators. Text animators will animate position, rotation, opacity, and other transforms. They are the basis of the typewriter effects and other text animation presets. They can be saved as your own animation presets. Text animators will also allow you to use wiggle bloat and other properties and effects and per character 3D allows the transformation of individual letters in X, Y, and Z space. So remember that those are the facts about text animators. Camera settings. A normal lens is a 50 millimeter lens. A 35 millimeter lens is a common wide angle lens. 135 millimeters is a common telephoto lens. Remember that these are different settings for camera and focal length, and that you access them in the camera settings dialog box. A camera orbit null. Remember when we made that spinning camera tutorial, you use a camera orbit null because that way the null moves, the camera stays where it was, and it just follows the motion of the null. And if there's something wrong with the motion, you can just delete the null and the camera is where it was to begin with. So a camera orbit null is an empty layer that is the parent of the camera layer and allows you to control the rotation and the position without changing the camera transforms itself. Keyframe types and interpolation. Remember the shapes of the keyframes. So the default is the linear, which looks like a diamond shape. Linear interpolation creates a uniform rate of change between the keyframes. Hold keyframes, it just stays there until it comes to another keyframe and then it jumps. Roving keyframes keep the spacing proportionally constant between the keyframes. Easy ease have Bezier handles, it will let you adjust the rate of change as the object nears the keyframe. It sort of, if you select a keyframe and call it easy ease, it sort of evens out 
the speed of the motion as it comes in and then leaves the keyframe. Easy ease in is like a train in a railway station. You ease into the station so you slow down to stop. And then easing out, you easy ease out of the station and speed up as you leave. So these are the keyframe interpolation types. When you select the Cinema 4D renderer, you will see this. This is the warning dialog that opens up to let you know what works and what doesn't with Cinema 4D. And we use the extruded and breveled text and shapes. We used reflections. We, some of you have used footage, curved footage layers. Those are fun. Um, and then remember that uh, the environment layer will only show in the reflection. So these are all important things that we can do with Cinema 4D. Remember what compression is. Compression allows you to save your file and make it smaller so you save space on your disk. It will reduce the size of your file. It keeps track of information, but it doesn't save each pixel. It goes ahead and it translates it into a code that's smaller. And codec is a term meaning coder, decoder, or compression, decompression. The video codec that we have been using is the H264. Camera moves. This is a change to what is visible by moving the camera or adjusting the focal length or lens, angle of the lens. So a point of view is a scene from the point of view of a camera. A close-up is an area of detail within a larger picture. A wide angle is a large overall view of the scene in establishing shot. And zoom in, zoom out is the continuous advance or retreat of the camera to the subject. And the pan, of course, is like when we did the, that sort of panning around in the camera, when we did the rotating camera to pan around the image. Horizontal, vertical, or diagonal scan of the subject by rotating the camera. So you, you move the camera to pan. And also remember the frame. Frame is a single image, part of a scene like a word in a writing. One image on screen in a moment in time. A keyframe is a frame that shows an important change in position or appearance, used as a guide for subsequent action, used in storyboards to tell the story, showing the beginning or end of the move. And also, of course, keyframe in computer programs, a keyframe is a piece of information that tells at a moment in time the settings and the position and all the different parts of the image that might have changed from one point to the next. So it holds on to the information. And here's the storyboard. A visual outline of an animation or a movie using keyframes to describe the action contains notes about dialogue, camera moves, and editing. A bit, one binary digit, zero or one in a memory cell in a computer. This is the smallest piece of information. It has two possible states, zero or one, on or off. Raster graphics. The image is composed of individual pixels on a two-dimensional grid. Images that are scaled up become pixelated and fuzzy, will lose definition, and will change the appearance. And vector which is object-oriented graphics. Mathematical formula is used to describe the shapes in the file, like a circle defined by its radius, a triangle defined by, by proportions and length of sides. And the fonts can be scaled without losing definition. They will appear the same at any resolution. So you can see that the nice sharp-edged A on the left is vector, whereas the fuzzy one on the right is a raster image. RGB color, which is the additive color system, primary red, primary green, primary blue. Add all the colors together, they make white because it's light. Light is emitted from the source. When they add together, they get brighter. The subtractive color system, this is used for print. 
it's ink on a surface and, and ink on a surface absorbs the light. So CMYK is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And black has to be overprinted. So it's, it's included as part of the system's name. When you add them together to make black and the yellow and cyan make green, magenta and cyan make blue, and magenta and yellow make red. But they're much darker than the colors of the primaries in additive color because it absorbs color. A pixel is a portmanteau word made from the words picture element. It refers to a dot of light on screen that makes up the picture. So good luck on your exams. The quiz has actually 20 section questions. I cut some out. It's multiple choice. It's based on the information in this review session. You will also complete an in-class project using provided files and information. And on the day of the final exam, please submit the project for tutorials. And also complete and submit the project for critique.